channel. Hello Internet! My name is Catherine Barsonistas, and you are watching The Gluttonous Geek Presents Munchies and Minis, a show where I make uh, recipes inspired by various tabletop role-playing games such as Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, Shadowrun, and whatever happens to fall across my table or my interest. Uh, today we are going back to, to the uh, Helm & Cloak Tavern that I mentioned last episode with the lemon fish recipe that I did. Uh, this particular recipe we're going to be making some stuffed Cornish game heads. Um, the Helm and Cloak, uh, as I stated last episode, is one of the more higher-brow uh, inns. Definitely not a tavern, as the ownership will say uh, to you. Uh, they're located in Baldur's Gate and are known for their uh, very, um, I want to say, gourmet offerings, as well as their extensive wine selection. So today's uh, recipe is based off of the lore with that. We're, um, Stuff, uh, Cornish game hens stuffed with fried onions and potatoes and a bit of uh, French bread with a marmalade vermouth glaze. So uh, since we have quite a bit to do with this recipe, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, you want to start out um, getting together your bread cubes. Now, I will admit, I was going to do this recipe last week, but um, yeah, the dishwasher um, filter got clogged. And I did not, we did not have a chance to actually start fixing it until the weekend. So that's why we are filming a couple days late, but not to worry. I'm just going to get my measuring cup here. We're going to try to get together about uh, two cups of bread cubes out of this baguette here. So I'm just going to grab myself a measuring cup to get that all together, as well as a serrated bread knife. Which, I mean, most bread knives are serrated, but, you know, sometimes you just need that little bit of extra clarification. So, since we are going to be, and I admit this loaf of bread has gone a little stale on me, but that's perfectly okay, because this is going to be soaked with melted butter and a little bit of vermouth, so it's going to absorb all that goodness, and as it's stuffed with the, um, inside the Cornish Game Hen, and also the Cornish Game Hen's gonna be releasing a lot of fat as it cooks, it's gonna soak up all those delicious juices, and it'll be just delicious. So, um, I want to be cutting these into about one inch chunk cubes, or chunks here. So, I'm just gonna make a slice, and cube it up. Roughly cut about an inch. Because that's roughly about a square inch right there. And these will shrink down when you add the melted butter, which we're going to be doing a little later. And as you see, if you're not new to the stream, you see I've changed my sound setup a little bit. While it's, I admit I'm not the happiest with its... Uh, sound quality. I at least don't have to worry about my sound popping out of me within like the last half an hour of the stream. Now this is supposed to last me about 18 hours, so there's that. So yeah, not only are we going to be stuffing the hens with this mixture, we are also going to be baking it on top of them. And I'm just going to go ahead and get these last bits here. It's a little over two cups, but that's perfectly fine because we have plenty of room in our roasting pan to spare, so no worries. So, there we go. And besides, we can kind of snack on some of the bread, maybe heat it up in the microwave a little bit and snack on it with some of the gourmet cheese that I picked up recently, as well as some of our garden fresh tomatoes, which have gone very ripe, not overripe yet, but just want to be able to enjoy them before they get all mushy on us. So there's that, and one more. There we go, a heaping two cups of bread cubes. Now I'm just going to go ahead and put that into a massive... mixing bowl. Ah! Let's go ahead and 
get that in there. And do some other prep. I'm gonna take two very large golden potatoes, or one extremely large golden potato, up to you. Hi, Moosey. My cat Moosey is saying hello. I would pick him up, but I don't want to get cat fur all over me when I'm about to work with raw poultry. Okay, so we're gonna dice this about uh, half. Um, actually, I'm gonna go put that back into the cup because I'm gonna be frying the potatoes and onions. I forgot about that for a second. Let's see, how did I actually write this? Okay. Bowl here. Ah! Bread all over the place. Oh, thanks, babe. Uh, Red Hand Films is just telling me that the mic is working. Okay, so just gonna get these into about half inch thick slices, roughly. That's about an, roughly about an inch. No. I'm just gonna do about half inch thick slices here. So, since we're getting to the end of that, I'm just going to slice that in half to create more of a stable platform. So, there we are. Okay, so we have that. Now it's time to dice them, as in create those half-inch planks. And throw them into the mixing bowl. So yeah, this is what we're making this week, and I still haven't really quite figured out yet what I'm going to make for next week's Munchies and Minis. I mean, I just got a hold of a bunch of old Forgotten Realms novels. I've just been asked to turn the music down a little bit, so I'm just going to do that a little bit. A little bit more. There we go. Okay, hopefully everyone was able to hear me earlier. Um, yeah, I just got a hold of a bunch of uh, Forgotten Realms novels. Uh, Humble Bundle. I'm not sure if they still have it on, but they have kind of an R.A. Salvatore showcase going on at the moment. And if you're a Drist fan, they certainly have books to spare. But uh, beyond that, I mean, I've done a lot of D&D so far. Um, I just posted up the video for my Pugmire-inspired recipe earlier this week. Well, by earlier this week, I mean yesterday. I made a smoked turkey stew with garbanzo beans and um, baked apples on top. Turned out really good. And I thought, you know, maybe I should make some uh, ration bars that you can also share with your dog. I mean, for those who don't know what Pugmire is, Pugmire is a uh, tabletop role-playing game where it's kind of a post-apocalyptic... Um, it's like post-apocalyptic means secret life of pets and Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's supposed to be in kind of a, a world like Earth after the humans disappeared and animals evolved uh, sapient intelligence. Um, they evolved to be bi bipedal and have opposable thumbs. So now we're in the, um, I want to say medieval <laughs> European type era of their evolution. So, so, kind of like a dog and cat based Zootopia meets D&D. &D. 
Um, but it's actually kind of funny because uh, instead of metal, the money is actually bits of plastic because they're considered human artifacts. But yeah, that one received a lot of good reception. Okay. All right. We're just cutting up the last bit of our potato here. Now we have to cut up our onion, which you're going to need one large red onion. Uh, feel free to use a uh, Vidalia onion or yellow onion. Uh, I'm doing this partially for a little bit more heat to it. Um, it tends to have a little bit more heat within red onions, which are actually technically also sweet onions. Uh, but another reason why I'm going is for appearance and color because, I mean, come on, we have our um, bread and our potatoes stuffing, but it's just kind of one note, one color. And the thing is, part of serving a meal is also appearance and plating. So it usually helps to have a little bit more color and variety to your dish to make it a little bit more appealing. So that's why we're going with red onion for this. That and I just, I kind of like them. So I'm just gonna cut off that bit there. And you also wanna do a half inch dice on this. So as a reminder, if I have not, uh, I don't think I've gone over it yet, proper way to hold a knife. Do not hold your knife like that. Uh, that will wiggle all over the place. Um, you want to put your forefinger of your dominant hand right here up against the blade. Your thumb, comfortably curl your fingers around the handle. And just kind of slice how you need to. All right, I'm just gonna take this bag out of here for veggie scraps. Normally I save them for stock bags, but we're kind of up to our eyeballs in stock bags. I need to run the crock pot soon. So, do a peel here. Yeah. Feel free to leave that last little bit on there because it makes it a little easier to hold sometimes. But uh, what you first want to do is a radial cut, which is kind of doing long cuts along the edge, along this the onion like so. Um, this will give you kind of a better idea of how to size things. Uh, but also you want to keep this end intact as you're slicing. That way it's not falling apart as you're slicing it. So. Just gonna kind of use the corner of my knife here to put in there and then draw it back and try to get it to as close as half an inch thickness as you possibly can. Those are kind of crap, <laughs> admittedly. Um, but But as you see, I'm also kind of rotating a little bit to kind of get a better handle on there. And make sure your knife is sharp. Having a dull knife causes a lot more kitchen incidents than having a sharp one. Because it catches and slips out of your hand and all that sort of thing. So just kind of eyeballing about a half an inch dice here. There we go. And as I get towards the end here, you can see me holding on to the peel so I don't have to get my hands anywhere close to it. I can just give that a toss, toss it into, just get rid of that butt on there, toss it into my 
bowl of potatoes and go ahead and get that in there. Okay, and I was being signaled by my husband for a second, so uh, babe, what was that? Okay. All right. So now I just need to dice the other side of that onion. Okay. And part of the reason why I'm putting the point of the knife in first is so it stays in the onion and is less likely to slip out and cut my fingers. Kind of works in sort of a lever action there. Alright. Okay, and that is our other half of our onion. All right, next up, part of prep, we need to put together our spice blend. Now, part of the description for this dish in the Forgotten Realms source book is well, the Baldur's Gate um, description of this dish is that uh, the potatoes are spiced, and the thing is, uh, this last past week when I made my Helm and Cloak Lemon Fish, I did sort of a take on uh, medieval spice ones, as well as flavors that would be associated, or a flavor, I guess, that would be associated with, um, sorry, with provincial France, or just French cooking. So... I'm not going to make you make a whole giant thing of, uh, what's it called, poudre four, which means strong powder in French. Uh, it's kind of a mix of black pepper, cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, um, just and ginger all just mixed together, and it gets the word from that warming sensation, so strong powder. Um, I'm going to save you the battle of having to buy a million different spices, and instead use a pumpkin pie seed, a pumpkin pie spice, because, I mean, come on, it's um, two days, it's October, it's already pumpkin spice latte season, pumpkin pie everything, and, yeah, and, I mean, even... Even if, you know, we're still stuck in home with the pandemic and everything, you're still going to want yourself some pumpkin pie. So go ahead and use that pumpkin pie spice that's, uh, that's calling your name and that's also on sale uh, at the grocery store. We're going to be mixing that with black pepper, which I'm sure you have possibly in spades. And as well as some dried thyme, which I am very low on, so we're going to be supplementing that with a little bit of ground thyme as well. Um, that and some kosher salt, which is over here. And now I just need to grab a dish as well as my measuring spoons. So I'm just going to put this back here for now. Grab some measuring spoons from the cupboard. And let's get mixing. All right, so for this blend, you're going to want, uh, let's see here, about a tablespoon and a half of kosher salt. One, two, and three. A tablespoon of... Uh, dried thyme, which, like I said, we don't really have that much of, but we're going to see how much we can get out of this and then supplement it. So, I think we've got about a little bit more, yeah, it's a little bit more than a half a tablespoon, so we're just going to supplement that with maybe about a teaspoon of dried thyme. Or rather, let's go with a half a teaspoon on that. Powder, the ground thyme tends to be a little bit more potent 
than just the straight up dry time. And to that, we're going to be also adding a teaspoon of black, pe uh, black pepper. And two teaspoons of pumpkin pie spice. Okay, that is all mixed, so that can go off to the side since we don't need it anymore. Alright, and I'm just going to be giving that a quick toss to blend that all together. And I'm going to go ahead and get about half of that to a separate dish for now because that's going to go onto our veggies and okay all right so now what i need to do is start getting the vegetables together so let's switch to our stove cam to our very large cast iron skillet here I mostly do uh, have this, it's about a 12 inch cast iron skillet. I'm mostly going for this size so um, we can get everything mostly on a single layer as we are cooking our potatoes and onions. Um, we're just going to preheat that for about three minutes. So I'm just going to set a timer right there for about three minutes to go. Uh, let's see here. You're going to want a total of about a cup of butter, uh, unsalted, uh, unsalted butter. Uh, bam. Um, one, you're going to be using a half a cup, which is about a standard uh, four ounce stick of butter. Let me see that. Is that four ounces? Yes, that's four ounces. Uh, is going to be going into the pan once it's nice and hot. The other, we also want to warm up, but we're not melting because we're going to be uh, making this into sort of a spice paste to um, put underneath the skin of our Cornish game hens and on the skin to kind of give it that nice browning before we start glazing it. So I'm just going to let that sit a bit longer, let it come to room temp. The other, I'm just going to wait on that extra couple of minutes and get this closer to what I'm working with here and um, hmm yes in the meantime though I need to get my oven preheated so you're gonna want to preheat your oven to about 400 degrees Fahrenheit so I'm just gonna go ahead and do that now while we are waiting for this skillet to heat up. Ah. And before, you know, I lose my voice kind of talking, but you know, oh my gosh, this is this is nice. This uh this mic here. I don't have to worry about like the cord dragging on anything or the battery pad going out on me. Mm. Right. Um, do 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 got about a minute. In the meantime, I'm just gonna grab one of my carving boards out here. So I'm gonna need one for preparing our Cornish game hens and one for cutting up our Cornish game hens to serve later on. I'm not gonna worry about that second part too much at the moment. But considering I'm also going to need that board to rest said Cornish game hens before plating, there you go. Okay, so got two Cornish game hens here. Make sure to let them thaw out completely before handling. And you would do this over a process of a couple of days in the refrigerator. Otherwise, you're going to have giant ice cubes in the middle of these birds, and that's not fun to work with. I've done it on more than one occasion. It ain't fun. 
Okay, we got five seconds left. Let's go ahead and just go ahead and let's go ahead to our veggies. All right, so um, we are preheated. Let's move. Let's put that stick of butter into our cast iron and get that melting. Let's see, slotted spoon, slotted spoon. Ah, yes, slotted spoon. Okay. Just gotta let that whole thing melt on down. Isn't that beautiful? It smells amazing, I'm not gonna lie. Melt, 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 melt. You know it's French style cooking if there's a crap ton of butter. Alright. Look at that. It's so melty and foamy and pretty. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add that half of the spice blend I was showing you earlier. What we're doing is we're blooming those spices in fat so we get all those delicious aromatic oils in the fat so it doesn't escape so much. And now that that's all melted, I'm just gonna go ahead and add our potatoes and onions. And we're just gonna stir cook that for the next five minutes to kind of soften them up a bit. It's gonna finish cooking, granted, in in the oven. But this will kind of give it a head start so we don't have crunchy potatoes. I'm just gonna add a pinch of kosher salt to that. Because I can. Potato out, and potato back in. Okay. Could probably go a little bit longer because I think that it hasn't really been, I think a skillet might have cooled down a little bit. But that mixing bowl that you saw earlier, I'm gonna go ahead and throw those bread cubes back in there. I'm not gonna lie, this smells amazing. This actually kind of uh, reminds me of the, um, scent-wise, if you've ever seen the Game of Thrones official cookbook, The um, Feast of Ice and Fire by Chelsea Monroe Cassell, uh, she has a potato leek soup that is just excellent. It also uses poudre four. Now granted, my version, when I like to play around with, when I like to cook it, I like to also throw some ground thyme in, so I'm definitely getting that scent that I associate with it, which, you know, it's, it's kind of fun for me, because, uh, you know, smell and taste are directly wired into our memory processes, so the smell, smell and taste are directly associated with memory. So, you know, there's that one thing that you're, no one makes quite as good as your mama? Well, it's because you have that memory so tied in close to it. I mean, something can taste like home because you associate flavors with memories. I just think that's kind of cool, you know? I think about two half minutes left on our potato onion mix, and you can see the onions are already softening down quite a bit. Um, might go for another, I want to say, minute or two on the potatoes, just because I'm a little paranoid. And they seem a little... not quite softened to me, but who knows, that might also change in about two minutes or so. Smell fantastic. Okay. I know I just said that. Um, right. 
got a minute and a half left on that. So while I am waiting for that to cook, I'm going to go ahead and drain these Cornish game hens of all the chickeny bits that I don't want to cook. Like use a steak knife that you don't really care whether it gets dirty or not. Your Cornish game hen should come without giblets, but sometimes, sometimes they leave them in, so make sure to check to make sure that there's nothing inside your Cornish game hen. This one does not have any giblets, and thankfully, all of the ice has been this. melting on me. Actually, you know, I think that five minutes was perfect. Look at that. That is browned and absorbs so much flavor. So, I'm gonna wash the chickeny bits off of me. Okay, that is done. So now, turn the heat off on there. Switch my camera around, so to my bowl of bread cubes here. Take this skillet here. And just empty that whole lot. Melted butter and all. Make sure you get it all out of there. that goodness together. Okay. And the bread should be absorbing all that melted butter. But I'm just going to add about a, ha a splash of vermouth to that, which should equal to about, you know, say about half a tablespoon, tablespoon or so. So there you go, splash of vermouth. Not entirely necessary, but it adds a little bit of extra liquid to it, especially if your bread has gone kind of stale like mine has. Ooh, and yeah, the acidic element does add something to to that. Oh man. I'm not gonna lie, that smells amazing. So I don't really have to worry so much about keeping this warm considering it's gonna go right into the oven with my Cornish game hen in a bit. But you know, it's uh... It's good to work quickly either way. Okay, so now that we're back to working with this other stuff. Let's go ahead and um, prep our Cornish game hens. So, I 
don't need this right here. I can just put that to the side for now. Keep the, my, my knife clean. Uh, I already got one Cornish game hen out. Uh, thing is, I want to pat these completely dry with paper towels because I want to make sure that the butter adheres nicely under the skin and over, well, near, adheres nicely to the skin. Um, and also it just kind of does for better browning in that particular sense. So, let's get this free, this chicken pen thing from its plastic prison. Ah. Well, not cutting yourself in the process. That is very helpful. Ah! Eh. It's okay. It's okay. This is all cooking anyway. Okay. Alright. All the juices. All the... The raw juices and everything are out of there. Get these in the bag, in the bag, in the trash. And my oven just told me that it is um, ready to start baking things. But I am not ready quite yet to start baking. So, a uh, hi there, Chip Tune, but Brony, I am. I am doing. It's been as usual. It's been a week. Um, but as you see, I am streaming early this week because I want to make sure that I get uh, another t two recipes out to my Patreon subscribers before the end of this month. So I'm going to be working on a bunch of recipe cards tomorrow. Okay, so we got our two Cornish game hens here. Um, I'm going to, babe, can you uh, grab some paper towels for me so I don't get the whole roll gross? Um, <laughs> Okay, just gonna do a quick pat here so I can transfer this. I'm gonna need more than that, but thank you. That. Yeah, I'm gonna at least. Oh, I should have put this thingy in the bag. Oh well. Thank you, love. All right, so just gonna pull out the camera a little bit so we can see it better. And babe, can you take that bread out of the way so I don't accidentally get chicken juice on it? Thank you, love. Okay, so I'm just going to completely dry, and get all these excess juices out of my hen. dry it as much as possible for the next step of the process here. There's one. And there's two. You want to get them roughly about the same size. Now this dish should feed about four people. Unless, you know, you're really hungry. Or, you know, if you just want to do a short bite and also serve the fish that I showed you last week, uh, you can feed this to about up to eight people. Just serve it in quarters. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you know, to each their own. Okay, cool. So, this next bit, we're going to be doing some stuffing as well as um, prepping the skin for this. So, what you will want after I... Mm, Get this all together. And this other dish here, and my hands clean again, even if just temporarily. Uh, you will want another half cup stick of butter and get that to as room temperature as you possibly can. Uh, you don't want it melted, but you do want it soft enough to work with. So, you saw that spice blend that I added half to the, the potato mixture earlier? Well, we are going to be dividing that remaining spice blend in half. And 
this stuff here. Yeah, just gonna get about half of that into another di another dish. Or rather, the first dish you saw me use. Because that will be going directly into our marmalade vermouth glaze. And this stuff, we're going to be mixing with that softened... Oh, thanks for the... You're very welcome. The, uh... Animal Crossing cupcakes recipe that I've got that just posted. Yeah, I really enjoyed making the playlist for that because I just did a ton of um, KK Slider, um, what's it called, covers for it. I mean, honestly, <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's like I used to listen to such gloomy stuff, and I'm like, now can I just have KK Slider cover everything? He makes me so happy. All right, so this butter could stand to be softened a little bit more, so I'm just going to throw it into the microwave for about five seconds to soften it just a little bit more. Okay. And hopefully that will be enough. Oh yeah, that is nice and squishy. So, squishy butter. I might have missed what you said after I asked you. Can you hear me now, Chiptune Brony? Okay, good. Okay, so you'll be microwaving that butter for about five seconds if it's not quite squishy enough. And I'm just kind of adding it to this half of the remaining spice blend here. And we're just going to be making kind of a paste out of this. It's like we want the butter blended with all of this goodness here. Like, just completely blended because not only are we using this to keep the skin moist on our Cornish game hens? We're also going to use this to season under the skin, as well as kind of add, uh, help a little bit with the browning on the initial pass into the oven. So. here. Okay, I can actually turn pages. All right. And And that should be all nice and good. Okay, so next, now that I've got all of this, take my half tablespoon thing right here, as well as move some stuff here, and we'll be using that as a measuring spoon for this. I'm going to keep this other spoon so it's easier to scoop the stuff out here. But got our chickens. Now what I want to do is start loosening Hey, cut that kick, uh, Dex, about the email I sent you. Yes, I did get that. Uh, I was actually planning on making that this week. The, um, what's it called? The honey elixir. I was planning on making my own version this week. I just need to be able to get to the Korean go uh, grocery store uh, this week because, um, at some point this week because uh, the thickener I wanted to use for it, uh, kudzu pow um, powder, um, I can't really get it in normal grocery stores, but it's often used in Japanese cooking as kind of a, as a uh, colorless, flavorless thickener, but it's also incredibly, incredibly he uh, health um, restoring, and it it's very healthy. Uh, I was planning on uh, doing that with kind of a green tea and honey, and um, yeah, so like, you know, it's honey fl uh, elixir, but also kind of a restorative sort of dish. Okay, so... 
Now I just want to carefully, carefully um, pull the skin away from the body. And thing is, you can find like the little pockets here where it starts to separate from. And you can kind of see where that kind of pocket is. I know it looks really gross, but I mean, if you just kind of carefully separate the skin from the meat like this, you can reach that and put butter in to help season the meat as well as keep it moist as it's roasting. I know, I know, it's gross! <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's okay. Don't worry, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna, like, post that comment, and no, no worries, ship to Brony, I, I know you mean well. Um, <laughs> I've had you on enough here to know that you mean well. Uh, so. Okay, so, that's been loosened. You want to get about a half a tablespoon of that spice butter paste right here under the skin on one of the sides like so and kind of I know this looks so wrong um, it's okay my wrongness is your entertainment um, and just kind of massage the chicken skin at top to kind of spread it around a little bit. I know it looks so gross! <laughs> okay. There we go. And thing is, as that cooks, it'll drain through the chicken to the stuffing inside and underneath the game hens as they cook. So that's going to be pretty awesome. Alright, so that's one out of four for this for the under the skin of the Cornish game hen. Now it's two out of four. Get ready for the grossness. Get ready for the grossness. Oh, it's going in. It's so gross. Yeah, the thing is, you cannot you cannot be finicky when you start cooking. Raw ingredients are gross. That's that is the price you pay. But you know what also feels gross? Clay. And I see sculptors still working with it, so... Okay. There we go. That's one. Let's spin this around. And get the other one. <laughs> okay. Half a tablespoon there. Come on. Alright, shove that in there, gently. And then... Do that to spread it around on the meat. Giggity. Alright, and here's the other half a tablespoon. You're going, well, what are you going to do with the rest of that? Oh, that's going to go all over the skin on this. Like I said, putting... A mix of butter and spices on ch poultry before roasting it gives this gorgeous mahogany color while roasting and just crisps up the skin so nicely. Okay, there we go. We've done it. All right, so now that it's underneath the skin, now I need to actually stuff the birds. So, oh boy. Hey, babe. Can you get me a quarter cup measuring cup? Yeah. Get some of that leftover butter in there. All right. And that's uh, that's an image you can't see. And babe, can you also help me out by taking that quarter cup measuring cup and depositing a quarter cup of that stuffing into here? Truly cannot unsee. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Okay, right into here. All right, and like I said, all of this is going to be going to the same place anyway, so I'm not too worried about the measuring cup getting gross. 
Uh, let's go ahead and get another one in there, too. Eh. Get in there, dang it. Alright. There is one. One stuffed Cornish game hen. Ah, ah, ah. Well. Eh. Spending, spending, spending. Okay. Okay. Two. Two Cornish game hens that are stuffed. Okay. And, uh, babe, if you could take that knife out and pour what's left of the stuffing into that roasting pan. Just kind of spread it out on an even layer using that slot spoon right there. Don't need this anymore so it can go away. And then, babe, if you can cut some pieces of kitchen twine for me. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and show you what I need to do. Uh, what's in the mixture? It is a mix of... Uh, gold potatoes and red onions with uh, cubed French bread that I cooked with butter and a spice mix made with pumpkin pie spice, black pepper, and dried thyme. Okay, so um, before I tie these legs together, I need to put this beautiful butter stuff all over the skin. It rubs it on the skin or else it gets the hose again. Um, but yes, all over the skin here. Just all over it. Into the crevices, I know. Cannot unsee. And that's... You want to get about a tablespoon worth of that butter paste on there. I need two because I'm trying to tie the leg, the, um, the back legs together. Just embrace the horror. <laughs> Thank you, Cupcake Dex. I will. I know I do every darn day. I live on this planet during the year 2020. Uh, I know, that got dark again rather quickly. It's like, yes, you will probably have remaining butter. That's fine. That is absolutely fine. Butter, 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 butter. Eh, it is so gross. Okay, so now I'm just going to tuck the legs under the bird on this guy. There are still arms. Oh, arms. Stuffed fowl. What's that stuffed howler? <laughs> oh. You know, I will admit, I kind of have a beef with um, fantasy writers because it's like, it's a million roasts or stews, but a lot of times it's stuff that doesn't exist or stuff where the similar thing does not um, happen to have a gro uh, American grocery store equivalent. Um, I mean, I have to make do. Like, I... You know you're a fandom food blogger when you try to find out what wolf tastes like. And to do so, you have to look up what dog tastes like. And seriously hope that the NDA... The, um, NSA is not closely watching your browser history. Um, just tucking those wings underneath the bird. Okay. Stay in there, dang it. Alright, and now I gotta wash all this off my hands just to get them dirty again. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Okay. All the butter. My hands are covered in butter. You know it's a French recipe when... No, I actually come to think of it, I can use a le what leverage left of that butter over my stuffing mixture. So... I might just... Mm. I'll show you that in a second. But first, I've got to get all this butter off my hands so I can actually manipulate things. Giggity. Um, 
quotables on the gluttonous geek. I have to get all this butter off my hands so I can manipulate things. All right. Is it off yet? That's what she said. Um. Alrighty, butter is off the hands. And you already cut the twine for me, love? Okay, good, yes. Oh boy, okay. So. Just shove that to the side. And put this up a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, of course the worst place to be in there people eat duck. Uh, um, well, I found out, interestingly, that uh, dog apparently tastes good. Um, I wouldn't do it myself, but what I had to do was, uh, apparently it tastes like a mixture of lamb and um, beef. Like a very, very beefy lamb. So what I ended up having to do was marinate um, flank steak with a lamb stock concentrate for that. And it actually ended up really good. So yeah, it's like, I'm not going to make you eat a dog. Because I can't do that myself. I will, I refuse to cook and present anything on here that I will not eat myself. I am also blessed to not have any food allergies. So I'm just going to tie these legs together here. So they are up and out of the way. And so it shows off that, that stuffing. It's like, uh, but yeah, uh, as Cupcake Dex says, like, um, it's entirely dependent on what's available, what's cheap. And the thing is, um, as long as it's done humanely, I have no issue whatsoever. But myself, yeah, I can't do it. Okay, there's one. I'm just gonna spin the board. Worst game is spin the bottle ever. Thank you, love. And get that back in there. It's like my friend here in Quebec eats horse regularly, but my friend in Oklahoma can't imagine. Yeah, I've heard horse meat's actually pretty decent. I mean, the thing is, when I was a kid, I was... I wouldn't even eat lamb. Because if, like, baby animals just kind of know I don't want to... But now it's one of my favorite things, and it's actually one of my specialties here on the Gluttonous Geek. Um, rack of lamb. Though I will say the one thing, the one, uh, I refuse to eat cat, obviously. And I don't, I've cooked rabbit before, I don't mind it, but I'm not the biggest fan of it. And part of it is that um, it just has this kind of gamey flavor I'm not the biggest fan of. The thing is, I love venison, but rabbit is too gamey for me, and it's just this weird kind of floral taste that I just can't really wrap my head around. I just don't like it. That, and also when they sell rabbit uh, here at uh, H Mart, it's, well, really anywhere you buy rabbit, um, for uh, rabbit meat, while they're gracious enough to remove the head for you, thank goodness, it's just meant, um, the shape of the body reminds me too much of my cat's body shape. And it, I mean, after making rabbit once, I was petting my cat, and part of my head's like, oh, here's the joint. I'm just going, nope, nope, never again. Not doing this ever again. Nope. <laughs> uh, I've also had pet rabbits, so... It's still a little too weird for me. I mean, I'll do it, but it's not my favorite thing to do. Uh, and while my hands are still covered in butter, uh, babe, can you bring over the um, pan here so people can see what I'm doing? Okay, so you got your pan of stuffing right here, all laid out in a single layer as much as possible. So we're just gonna take our Cornish game hens in their assembled glory, glory and stick them right on top. And close, uh, far away apart from each other, so you can glaze them easily. Um, I'm just going to take the, what's left of that butter paste and kind of toss it around the pan some. Get the undersides of the legs a bit. 
I wasn't able to get that earlier. And this will all absorb nicely as it roasts. So I'm just going to move this to the sink because I don't need it anymore. As well as that carving board, which is really gross right now. Okay. And I think it is good time if, babe, if you can move the chicken for me over to the side. Uh, I'm going to start washing up some things. In the meantime, I'm going to pass the microphone to my husband where he has a cocktail recipe for you. Okay, hello internet. Uh, my name, I'm, I'm off screen at the moment. Give me one second. Aha. All right. Hello. Uh, those of you who have been watching the Gluttonous Key for a while uh, may know me. I am Carter Eastis. Uh, I'm Catherine's husband. And occasionally I like to come here and show off a little cocktail. So tonight we've got a very special cocktail for you. Uh, it's, it's one that is very simple and good for really any occasion. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take a glass of ice. Gather all your ingredients. Take yourself a glass of ice. And uh, then, well, let me switch. There we go. Aha. You take that glass, and you're just going to dump out the ice. And then you're going to take this thing called scotch and pour it in the glass and drink it. This is my cocktail recipe. Enjoy. And round of applause for very, very uh, informative, um, <laughs> informative demonstration there. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, now we're on to the next part. So our oven is nice and hot, um, currently at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, already preheated. We've got our chicken here. I'm just going to, oh gosh realize that I forgot to salt the damn birds. It's okay. We're going to salt the damn birds, even though it's going to fall right off. But yes, salting, 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 salting. Ha, huh, salting. Okay. Salt the damn birds with a pinch of kosher salt. Ah, there's condensation on my notebook. And uh, you want to bake this in the oven for about an hour. So, thank you, love. Just gonna stick that in there. Set a timer for uh, about 15 minutes to start out with because we're gonna first need to make our glaze, which we're gonna start glazing the bird in about 15 minutes. Uh, so, what you're gonna need for this glaze is eh, to not step on your measuring spoons, for one. Um, you want to look at your ingredient list to figure out how much you actually need. You're going to need about a cup of dry vermouth. We already got a measuring cup here. Got our vermouth over here. Pour that cup of vermouth into our small little saucepan right here. Next, you're going to want about a half a cup of marmalade. I'm using the leftover blood orange ginger marmalade. I have the Via Fruta, Via Fruta uh, marmalade that I made on Munchies and Minis 
a couple of episodes ago. Uh, do you have to use this? No, but if you have any left over, it adds some extra flavor, so that's pretty darn awesome. That, and with all that extra orange rind in there, it's just going to give a lovely orange flavor. So, I believe this is about a half a cup already, but I'm just going to pour this in here and hope for the best. Let's see, is that about a half a cup? That is a half a cup. Bonus. That was also my last jar of the stuff, so I'm going to have to make some more soon. Unless I have another hiding in the pantry somewhere, that's very likely. So, just going to add that to our saucepan. As well as try to clear the jar a little bit. And put that in the dishwasher, because we don't need it anymore. Not the dishwasher, the sink. Which will then go into the dishwasher once all this stuff is washed off. Yes, I have a plan for these things. It may not seem like a completely thought out plan, but it's a plan nonetheless. Alright, so we got that. And... Derpa 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 der. Um, we are going back to our stove top. So we got that. And what's left of our spice mix, just gonna get that in there. And turn the heat on medium. Medium high. I'm just gonna give that a whisk. It's in the dry ingredients there. And we need to get that to a boil. So I'm just gonna throw a lid on there right now to get it hot as possible, get the boil going as quickly as possible. In the meantime, let's go ahead and get some cleanup done. I don't need a spatula anymore, so... Or do I? I might need a spatula. I haven't decided yet. I will keep the spatula around. In case I want to serve with it later. It's, it's clean. All it's had is marmalade. It's fine. The other stuff goes into the sink. I'm keeping an eye on the thing to make sure that it starts boiling. Now I can put stuff in dishwasher. Okay. Now I just gotta do all of the tetrising. Yes, that's an actual word that I just made up. No, I didn't. I did not make that word up. We'll say when cleaning butter off of things, it's usually good to use hot water. My water is not hot. And my dish towel is on the floor where it shouldn't be. So it is now going in the laundry. Okay, how are we doing on that glaze? Okay, we've got a simmer, but not quite at a boil yet. So, still waiting. Where's my lemonade? Here's my lemonade. Oh. Ah, oh, goodness. And with about 42 minutes left in the episode, we are making great time. Um, yeah, making great time. Whew. Something tells me I should have had another recipe lined up or something. It's just the waiting game. It's like you've done all the prep, now it's just roasting or baking. I mean, that's just, that's how it is. Roasting, baking, cleaning up, putting on makeup when you get there. Wait, what? So, all right. Big thing about cooking, clean as you go. Are we boiling yet? No, we're getting there. We're getting there. Just gonna let the water heat up. Drink more lemonade. Oh, wait a minute, I do need to make a new batch at some point. Ooh, I've got a tiny bit of remove left. So it's going in my lemonade. I've earned it. Give that a quick stir. Is our hot water hot yet? Well, our glaze certainly is, so let's switch to that cam. As you can see, it's at a boil. So, just need to whisk, 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 whisk. Whisk that all together. 
turn down the heat just a little bit, down to about a medium low, and let that simmer for about five minutes. So our water is hot, our glaze is simmering, and I'm finally getting the butter off of this darn cutting board. Yay! Things are happening how they're supposed to. And I do thank you for joining me. I hope that I am at least somewhat less uh, stressful to watch than, you know, the presidential debate tonight. I will admit that's also one of the reasons why I'm streaming tonight. One, because I need to get caught up on some recipe cards for this month. Which, if I do manage to make it out to H Mart tomorrow, I'll make sure to also have that mana, uh, trials of mana honey elixir for my Patreon subscribers. Oh, I can smell the thyme and orange. Oh, that smells so freaking good. Not gonna lie. It smells tasty. And make sure I have all the butter off the spoon. Yeah, that's the trouble with them. Um, trying to get a lot of the fats off. Sometimes if you have a little too much of the fat left over on your dishes before putting them in the dishwasher, it can clog the valve. Like it did with mine. Which is why we didn't have an episode last week, despite having all of the ingredients. <laughs> That's why the bread that I was using for tonight's stuffing was also stale, but I think it actually worked out this that way. Because then it can absorb all those delicious juices. So, I am not complaining. Okay. Mmm. Like I said, orange and thyme. Just a beautiful beautiful scent combination that is wafting into my nostrils right now. Okay. I can clean the rest of that in a little bit. Right now it's just more important I clean my hands. Okay. Ooh. Uh, I don't know if I have time to paint, babe, because I'm going to be glazing every 15 minutes. Unless you want to paint. Okay. Well, um... Sure. Is that? Well, right now it's on the stovetop cam, but you can change it to the prep cam to paint. So yeah, my husband might be painting for a uh, mini painting for us a little bit while I do more cleanup, so you actually have something a little bit more to watch. Let's see. It's time for time, Durher. What did the orange say before he went to work? Back to the grind. Ah. Ah. Well, it's Ch Chiptune Brony, you definitely win dad joke of the week. So, uh, I will be sending you this recipe card. Uh, Chiptune Brony, are you on the, um, <coughs> pardon. <coughs> You ever, <coughs> you ever choke on your own spit? Yeah, that just happened. <coughs> no, not the bad joke of the week. The dad joke of the week, as in who's your daddy. Um, but that said, it also applies. <coughs> oh, goodness. So yeah, uh, chiptune brony. Um... Do you currently have the uh, Munchies and Minis recipe card Patreon uh, benefit or the uh, blog post uh, recipe card benefit? I remember you're—I remember you're one of them. I just can't remember which one off the top of my head. Um, Seven dollar. Okay, so you get everything. <laughs> okay, I will—I will find something. I will find something to send you an addition for that, that making me choke on my lemonade. Um. Mm -mm. Cupcake Sex, thank you for joining us. Uh, have a good dinner. I know I will, once it actually finishes cooking. Okay. So, this has been... Simmering for about five minutes. And smelling freaking fantastic. Not gonna lie. It smells fantastic and looks fantastic. So, about 15 seconds left. And, uh, yeah, it will be done. The uh, glaze will be finished. 
but uh, I still have to wait another four minutes for the um, that 15 minute timer to go up. So I'm just gonna turn that off and put a lid on it. Take it off the heat for it to cool somewhat, but not entirely. Uh, just enough to be able to adhere to the Cornish game hen as I brush it on later. So, with that, let's switch us back to my prep cam. Because Carter has um, decided he wants to paint for you guys. So, here's the mic. All right, hello, internet. Uh, so I am still enjoying my classic cocktail here. Um, and this is gonna be uh, a little longer, a li little more in depth than the cocktail section. Uh, but I will warn you, I literally threw this together uh, as Catherine was talking when I realized she said the Cornish Game Hen was going to be in there for an hour. All right, yeah, we need to fill in a bit. So, I, I'm gonna start by actually showing off some of the minis and things I've been working on. Uh, for those who don't know me, I have been, for the past year, I've been uh, doing a lot of 3D printing. Really gotten into it. I've kind of bought into a, uh, a system uh, I'll give a little shout out to printablescenery.com. Great system. Love them. I got on a one of their Kickstarters. And if you can get on a Kickstarter for them that, you, that looks good and you like, it's amazing because you get this entire system to work with. So the system I got was called Chlorhaven and the Goblin Grotto. And it is a set of 3D printable interlocking tiles. I'll, I'll, I'll get in get in a little closer here in a second. Um, so one of the great things is I uh, I've been able to everything I'm going to show you tonight is made here in our house uh it was designed by somebody i got the file for it whether it's part of this th uh the printable scenery kickstarter or it was a free file that somebody uploaded to thingiverse i uh, i download the file i run it through a slicing program that i then upload to my 3d printer and i print pieces off Sometimes one at a time, sometimes a bunch of pieces at once. I, I, I've, I think the longest 3D print I've ever had was 36 hours, but I can have little ones that are less than an hour. But it all comes down to creating stuff like this. So I'm gonna first show off this switch to the tripod for one second so as part of the scenery I got various floor and wall and roof and furniture pieces that allow me to make houses my ultimate oh uh, can... we're, pa we're pausing for a second Catherine needs your attention We're switching over to the stovetop cam for Catherine. It's pointed kind of towards our oven as much as our... Here, let me just hold it. I'll, I'll hold and narrate. Here we are looking at the oven. She's opening the oven, pulling out that tray. And from here, we're going to take the glaze, and she is going to base that onto those Cornish game hens. While, 
while splashing all over the oven. It's okay. Self-cleaning oven. Close the oven up. We're going to set the timer for another 10 to 15 minutes on there. All right. So, where was I? Um, so, ultimately, my goal is in various, you know, D&D &D adventures and stuff, uh, I want to have a full town set up that people can play in with these uh, this, these scenery bits. Not only will I have the town, eventually I want to have like the sewer system under the town. I want you to literally be able to lift up a layer off the table and here's the sewer system. And that sewer system leads to the cave system and the grotto, the underdark way down below the town. So, um, this, this first smaller piece, switch over to the prep, to show off, is just a nice little tiny shack. And I realize that's upside down for all of you. This tiny little shack, which I have included a bunch of, again, 3D printed furniture pieces. There's a trunk, a bed, a chair, a table. But uh, what you really need to see is the system that holds it all together. Uh, this is called the open lock system or the open forge system. Basically, these are tiles that are printed, you know, about two inch square uh, and are held together with these various clips. And everything is modular. You print, you can just print out a ton of these and make whatever you want. I followed a lot of guides on what to make. You know, this this was one of the guides from Printable Scenery, uh, one of the floor plans, if you will. But I can very easily break this apart down to a bunch of components. Here, here are the the clips. I print dozens and dozens and dozens of these clips. But when it comes down to it, look, that's that's one wall tile. Again, about a two inch square. I uh, the floor tiles, you know, two inch wide by two inch uh, deep, whereas the the wall tiles about two inch tall and two inch wide. But it's an amazing system. I've been having a lot of fun painting. And recently, uh, you know, I, I've printed a lot of it, but now getting into the painting part, the painting is actually super easy. This stone stuff, uh, I give everything just a flat black spray paint. That's it. I lay all my pieces out, spray paint them, you know, flip them over super simple stuff the simple spray paint you can buy it you know for and i'm talking the cheap stuff you can buy at a hardware store or walmart for one or two dollars so i do that and then i use these super cheap like craft paints none of this is done with the expensive miniature paint stuff I can show you everything 
that goes into making this wall here. We've got the black spray paint, which, oh, I happen to have a bottle nearby. Look at that. Boom. Black spray paint. Done. This dark gray acrylic craft paint. After the spray paint's done, I just do, I paint all the stone in dark gray. Nothing special about it. Just take a brush, slather it on. Don't, you know, glop it on, but nothing special there. Once that is done uh, and dried, with the, uh, the, sorry, checking my paints here. With the, the dark gray, then I just take this gray, it's lighter. That, I'm gonna do a dry brush. Put a little bit of this in a tray, get a tiny bit on my brush, wipe it off a bit. Super simple. Drop the paint. Good thing it didn't open up, but just super simple. Dry brush across the surface. That's the kind of the motion it is. And it's done. The wooden bits, if the piece happens to have wooden bits, not all of them do, like obviously the floors, no wooden bits. That is just a dark brown first. Just paint it on normally. And then there's this, nope, nope, where is it? Ah, and for that one, I use this, uh, the khaki as a super quick light uh, dry brush on it. If you really want to get detailed, I'm not sure how well you can see it. There are some metallic bolts and rivets uh, on these. You don't really have to hit those, but that is the one point where I do like the, the miniature paint. There's this uh, Citadel-based lead belcher. That's really the only, in, in doing these, that's the only fancy miniature paint that I've used. Um, for the roofs, uh, I came up with a blend to get this nice blue slate. I want to say it was just very simple. The bright blue here. I did five drops of bright blue. And one drop of black. That gave me the right blue color I was looking for. After that, it got a very quick dry brush with a bit of white. And it's done. Super easy. Uh, not very expensive. You know, I, I know a lot of people think that you got to go invest a lot into tons and tons of these miniature paints. This is terrain. Uh, there are going to be hundreds of these pieces. We go for the cheap stuff you can buy at Michael's or Hobby Lobby or other, you know, at Walmart, various craft stores, uh, just to get it some good coverage. So that is, uh, now that covers this little little building here tiny little little shack you know your 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 party might come across this little shack in the woods uh you, you'd find a a you know some person living there that gives them information for their quest and knowing most D, &D parties they'll most likely kill the person um it happens you know we try not to murder hobo but we murder Hobo. That's true. 
when you get into the uh, the more complicated builds, it's even a little hard to, to show in full. Uh, let me switch the tripod. So this is the tavern I have printed and painted. This is a two-story structure with roof that has an amazing balcony on it. And let me just give it a little quick wipe of the cutting board. There's some sticky marmalade. Oh, they can. Atlanta will be able to have a full kind of building stocked game where you can we have like little miniature like quick mi miniatures that Carter's printed up for you to use um, on environments that he's printed and painted uh, as well as a I want to say four course meal um, four to six course meal at least at least uh, as well as you know some of our homemade mead and some signature cocktails for the evening. So once the plague subsides and we can actually put this together, this is going to be part of that. So um, really hope to get that going this upcoming year. Mm -hmm. So just to show off a little here, um, we'll, we'll start, you know, your adventures enter on the ground floor of the building so we pull away the uh the higher up pieces and look you've got the interior of a tavern complete with furniture and bits look at here. here's uh these are kind of scattered I, i've even printed mugs to go on the tables this is a fully, you know, functional tavern. It's it's lived in. They can enter here. I uh, decide what they want to do. They'll probably just kill the bartender because that's what D and D parties do. Um, and then from there, you know, we can uh, we can go. You know, there they'll come in, kill that guy, come up the stairs. And now we just take the stair, the second story unit, pop that on here. Look, we've got another place to uh, to kill these guys um, because everybody's gonna die. That's just how it works. I've played enough to know. Um, and you know, maybe they'll sit down and have a nice drink, but someone's gonna die. And uh, yeah. The roofs are great for also, you know, just being able to keep things concealed. You can hide things from her. You can, you know, have it pop out. They, they're they going into a building not knowing what's there, which is life most of the time. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to being able to implement this, uh, do a full scale game, lay out the full city, everything. So, uh, I'm going to set these pieces off to the side. And we're good on time, everything. How we doing? What's what's the status on our, our game hints? Uh, we got two minutes left to like, glaze them, uh, glaze them again. Okay. maybe move it to seven. I, I kind of want to have more of the glazed catch, but um, it is a thinner, the marmalade is a little thin compared to most commercial marmalades. So um, we'll see how it looks after the next glazing. I'll uh, glaze this and then hit for maybe another seven to 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Well, we've got a plan. It's going to take a while for those. So, um, We're going to go on to some actual minis. Now, 
uh, let me just check. Yes. Everything on my, uh, not my, Catherine's painting stand here are items that I have 3D printed. Uh, I found this great 3D designer. Uh, I'm going to have to look it up, look him up while... Catherine is doing the glazing so I can give them credit, but they created this this whole race of mud people. Uh, they, they call them clod kin, as in like earthen, you know, cl cl clods, balls of earth. So, uh, we're going to switch to the stove. browning on here, but I also want more blades to stick, so I'm going to see if I can pour some blades directly on the bird here, about a tablespoon each, and then just kind of brush a little bit more, get it in those nooks and crannies there. start doing in about 10 minute uh, increments now because I want to get more glaze on there and more of it sticking. So I'm just going to change to that for about 10 minutes this time. And it might even go a little bit longer, depending. Okay. Uh, so back to her painting. While she was going through, I looked up. I want to give credit to Dutch Mogul on Thingiverse. Uh, an amazing designer literally has I want to say like almost a thousand design files up on Thingiverse. Uh, these are all everything on Thingiverse is, is free to use. Um, I think most is under a Creative Commons license, but they have put all this amazing stuff out in the world. So Definitely, thank you to Dutch Mogul. Uh, I really fell in love with their earthen kin, uh, earthen kind uh, set. They literally created an army to, to play with. And uh, I'm gonna try and see if some of these little guys will show up here. So these are little kind of humanoid figures that just look like they're made of clumps and clods of dirt. So here we have one wielding two axes. Uh, here we have, you know, a little, little clodkin with a sword. Um, some of my, my favorites are Oh, the Stalag Knights. So these are knight warrior figures holding lances and shields, uh, but it's all made from like stalactites and stalagmites that you would find in a cave. These are your perfect little underground army that can raise up out of nowhere, come from the very walls, uh, this guy is called a, a, a clobber. He's, you know, he's just a big rock thrower. Um, even down to, it, it's amazing how much they've in, they've created. Here's a dead one. Uh, though I do think my favorite is the Earthenkin King. Uh, available in three modes. So here, this is 
partially painted. You have the king sitting on his throne. Um, what I've done here is literally just did a black spray paint on him uh, and then a light gray dry brush on just the throne. Uh, I have not painted this king yet. Here, you have the empty throne because he's not always gonna be there. Same deal, black spray paint, light gray brush. And I think this is one of my favorites. This is the king's war throne, his traveling throne. Uh, this one I have fully painted. Uh, so you have the king on the chair that is being carried by four underlings. He is being held aloft, riding his throne into battle. Um, you know, it, it's it's got just such great detail on it. You've got his nice little crown, his scepter that has crystals growing out of it. Uh, one thing I've actually done, and I, I plan on possibly uh, implementing in a future game, is I took the file, uh, the design file from the king, and I cut the crown off. I took that crown off of it, created it as its own separate file, and I actually blew it up to what could actually be life size. Um, now, I, I imagine these guys are shorter. They're, they're more no, gnome dwarf size. So that, can, that crown is gonna be quite small on a human. But still, uh, you know, maybe you come play a game and the, if someone decides to kill the king, I'm not promoting, uh, you know, regicide, but uh, maybe that player might get to take the king's crown home with them. Who knows? We'll see. Um... So again, for this, uh, because this is kind of a you know a big bulk army, um, I'm working on. Um, I'm using the very basic acrylic paints, cheap stuff you can find in the store, and just doing little highlights. You know, the king has a gold scepter. Uh, I, he's got this like centerpiece on his chest that we've done that I've done in gold and his crown is gold so for that we're gonna pick up I don't even remember what I did but that's you know the gold is not something you really find in the cheapy paints but it literally just takes a drop or two of the uh, the nice fancy ones so um, my wife lets me take from her stuff when it comes to that uh, very very minimal um but since this is much as a minis i've been talking a lot let's let's get into just a little painting so i've got this i've got the king here i have version two of the king this is the king on his throne as you would find him in the throne room i uh, so far i've just done the throne haven't touched the king yet so we're gonna go Grab these brushes over here. Just give me a little water, honey. All right. So I treated these earthen kin very much in the way I treated the wood in the uh, the buildings. I did. We're gonna start out with just a. a believe it yeah it was just a dark brown and I'm just gonna do a drop of that Let me, uh, clear some space here it's 
So yeah, we'll just start with a drop of that. And make sure I've got what feels like the right brush for me for this. Mm-hmm. So, um, what I'm doing here, I'm not really dry brushing, but I'm not going to slather it all on. What I don't want to do is get my brush deep down into every little crack and crevice. It's got that brown paint on it. Uh, sorry, it's got that, that black paint on it already. And if I don't go in deep into those cracks and crevices, that black is going to show through and it's going to make those cracks look even deeper. We'll get a pretty, you know, we'll, we'll get a decent base coat on everything that, uh, that needs to be done here. But, uh, yeah, just, just let us skim over. You know, I'm not, not going deep into the eyes. I'm not going to go fill in his mouth with brown. Let's leave that the black. And, uh, yeah. So, Catherine is about to check on the chicken again and do the next glaze. sure to brush all the surfaces on there. about the name of that really unsettling character uh, from Utopia, that would be Arby. Uh, wears a windbreaker, has this uh, comb-over haircut, always eating raisins, and also has this very monotone voice. No, not really showing any emotion whatsoever. Yeah. It's unsettling. Arby was creepy. Yeah. technician and prop maker, so he's he's done a little bit of everything. And uh, Chip Tune Brony says he's been always wanting to get a 3D printer, and if you need tips about that, this is the guy to talk to, because um, he's... I think ours is only 300, but... I, it, my, uh, my 3D printer was only about 200 on sale, uh, and now, of course, it's, you know, it's old news. Um, but... It is one of the best-selling intro cheap 3D printers. It is the Creality Ender 3. Highly recommend it. It's going to take some learning. It's, uh, it's not a plug-and-play device. No 3D printer really is yet. Um, but it has been... 
it's been a great joy and learning experience for me to to figure all this stuff out to uh to kind of to become part of this 3d printing community uh that before i got the printer i didn't fully know existed um but yeah, I highly recommend the Ender 3. Uh, I know Creality is just really... There, there's also the Ender 3 Pro, uh, usually about a $50 more. Um, and I know they've also recently re released the Ender 3 version 2, uh, which kind of combines a lot of the pieces that they added on the Pro model and just a lot that they've learned. Um, it's it's a wonderful hobby it is it's amazing it's such a joy when things come out great uh and then you know occasionally you just get a giant massive spaghetti uh you know literally i get prints that come out looking like dried ramen um Especially if, um, if you're having some kind of troubleshooting issue, you can just post a picture on there, kind of tell what the model is, and uh, some of the issues, and they'll like, be more than happy to uh, give you a way to fix the problems you have with it, because there's uh, a very strong chance that someone on the subreddit has the same printer as you do, and has dealt with that issue before. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a fun group. There, there are there are actually quite a few uh, subreddits. Uh, if you're gonna get a 3D printer, I recommend joining. Um, well, for one, if you're watching Munchies and Minis, then you have some interest in D and D and geekery and things. Uh, there's an entire subreddit Reddit called Printed Minis. Um, there are also a lot of people on the subreddits. D N D I Y. Uh, that posts their 3D printed Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Um, Fix my print is a good subreddit to go to if you're having trouble with things. There is also just a sub specifically for the Ender Three. It's that popular. So many people have it. All right, so. I have given our Earth Clod King a very simple base coat of dark brown. He looks like a turd, as he should. Um, I'm going to let some of those elements in there air dry just a little bit as I prep my next stuff I need to find because I want him to match this other Earth King here uh, so I need to find that gold I've used before for the scepter I also used a blue for the crystal and then a white dry brush on it uh, yeah, and that, that gold also goes for the scepter, his, I don't know, heart stone there in the center, and his crown. So, just trying to remember which one I actually used, and it may have been... Those are thumbs up at you. Yep. No, wait, that's... There you go! Well, no, I, uh, I asked those great visuals, and Chip Tube Brody, uh... Oh, by the way, that is an enamel paint, so... That's not the one I've yeah, used. I'm uh, looking... I need, I need to take the enamels out of there. We thought... Uh, the thing is, we thought a bunch of those paints were flat paints, but we were wrong. So it's very difficult. Ah. Uh, are you looking for silver, or... The oh, gold. The gold. Okay. Here it is, this Citadel Base uh, Retributor Armor. The playlist, uh, Chip Tomb Road is asking what the playlist he sent me reminds me of. It reminds me a little bit of Doom. Um, 
I know that sounds a little stereotypical, but considering Frank Herbert kind of offers these sort of heavy metal sort of um, visuals within the novel, I mean, it's it, it kind of reminds me of that some. So um, I will say that um, Cats on Mars is a great name for a song. Um, I will admit, I haven't had a chance to listen to everything on the playlist um, I've seen, because uh, another reason why I'm happy to listen to new stuff is that I I can only, whenever I'm searching for stuff for playlists, I'm going off of names of things, I'm going off of fields for things, I'm trying to find playlists that feel sort of like, get the sort of um, <clears throat> ambiance for me for certain uh, genres. Um, like for example, I mean, uh, you saw, like the asparagus bacho, uh recipe that I did uh, for Don't Starve. Uh, you remember that, um, what's it called, the, uh, there's a bunch of kind of murder ballads on there, and murder ballads is just what it sounds like. It's a, there's kind of a folk genre where it's a lot of songs about killing people or people getting killed. Um, and considering there's also a very cabaret sort of feel to the animation style and um, character malaise that you find in Don't Star, that was why I was trying to go for sort of the murder ballad -y and cabaret feel with the playlist. Uh, if I want to go with the, um, let's see, um, another one was for Dresden Files, the Max Summer Lemonade. I was trying to go mostly for just kind of a laid back feeling summer playlist. I mean, while trying to also put some Faye stuff in there as well, but it really just depends on the work that I'm making a playlist for. I will admit that um, one recipe that I've released on Patreon that I still haven't released to the public yet, uh, for Drifting Dragons, that the um, cast iron, like the chicken diavola, <laughs> believe it or not, the reason why I haven't released it yet is I'm still trying to figure out a playlist for it. Um, I've got a couple of songs from the anime Drifting Dragons on there, but I don't want it just to be a Drifting Dragons and, like playlist. I want it to be, like, I want it to have songs that are also fitting for the show without it fitting for that particular recipe, which is an Italian recipe, um, than just the soundtrack, because why would you come to my playlist to just bring up the soundtrack that you can bring up on Spotify anyway? So um, that's actually why, yeah, San Komodo Curry does sound good, but I, I would, unfortunately with the blog, I do kind of have to work with published works too, just to be able to have a fan base um, going. Um, but yeah, um, Drifting Dragons, the anime, really fun show, um, based off of manga, um, where this, it's kind of like a whaling thing, I know, but with dragons, because dragons have oil, but, um, the thing is there's one character who always wants to eat every dragon they come on, and at one point they do, a uh, dragon, uh, Diavola. A very small dragon is found uh, not too much larger than a chicken, so they use the chicken diavola method. Oh, it was delicious. I was a little harrowing because I had to flip an entire flat chicken on a giant cast iron multiple times. And then I had to put it on a But it turned out great. And it's on the Patreon uh, recipe archive for blog post recipes. So basically, the um, all the cards and more food please levels and above. Um, 
And right now, I'm just trying to work all of the glaze, what's left of the glaze, onto this bird, onto these birds here. So, I am, scoop, I am spooning glaze onto the birds. I am brushing it on to even it out. If there's mostly orange rind on these things, that's perfectly okay. This is going to be freaking delicious, and I will love eating this after I get pictures of it. Uh, but yeah, like I said, the reason why I haven't posted it to the blog yet, even though it's, I did this recipe back in July, was that I still, I'm still i still having trouble putting together a playlist for it. Alright, now I'm saying it's time for the final 10 minutes of this roast. All the glaze is off there, so I'm just going to put this in the sink because I don't need it anymore. Get that to soak a little bit, get all that excess glaze out of there. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, let's see, got a couple of other things coming up, um, goodness, like I said, um, Ch Chimbrone, I have that, uh, honey elixir recipe I'm gonna try to make tomorrow, um, and to be honest with you, it's been kind of hard coming up with more, um, more stuff as of late. Part of it is I just, I need to read more books. Uh, I recently got a Kindle version of Lovecraft Country, um, which I want to see if they actually describe it and include it. Uh, I love the show so far, what I've seen on HBO, but I just haven't, I've seen food on the table, but they never actually drift over it long enough to see what they're actually serving. However, uh, I'm kind of tempted to do something based off the episode where, um, not the most recent one, but the one before that, or no, the one before that with Ruby, uh, so kind of doing sort of a north side Chicago style dish, but done very south side, or the other way around. I'm a little worried about how that might be portrayed. But, um, if I present, if I do it enough as a commentary where it brings out the entire point, like maybe a south side dish, but dressed up enough to where it would be served on north side of Chicago, and thus uh, pointing out even further the uh, racism, especially when it comes to how white people uh, appropriate a lot for, um, a lot of, uh, minority dishes. I think that could be a very good topical post. I, um, but I just, I need to do a little bit more research because also as a white woman doing this, I want to be as sensitive to um, the culture associated by the culture that is experiencing this sort of thing. So um, that's what I'm thinking about doing for another blog post soon. Um, I actually, I was in Chicago last year, in April, and I'm actually pretty sad that I didn't have a chance to go to any Southside restaurants. And part of it, I was doing a lot of research for, uh, based on Dresden Files book series, which mostly takes place uh, downtown north side of Chicago. Um, you don't really see the South Side so much, so it's, it's interesting also getting to see that in Lovecraft Country. Um, let's see. Also thought this curry could have an earthy flavor with a pinch of allspice. Allspice is pretty good for curry. Um, try at, like, mm, I'm trying to think if, like, you're saying it's a sand Komodo curry, so you're gonna want stuff that could thrive in the desert, or at least an oasis, uh, nearby. I know that at least in, um, Fennel seed is very prevalent in curry, both Indian curries as well as Mediterranean cooking, especially Italian cooking. So you could kind of say that if it happens to be a uh, sea bordering desert, or at least in some oases, they could plant fennel. Uh, and you could use fennel seed for the curry, or at least in the spice root. Uh, the um, yeah, the spice root, and it'll add a very this kind of interesting um, licorice sort of scent to it. I mean, it's uh, basically if you've had Italian sausage, that's the flavor you get with fennel seed. 
um, like Italian sausage on pizza, it's that's fennel seed. That basically straight up fennel seed. Um, what I've learned about ground fennel seed is you need to toast the fennel seed before grinding it. Yeah, right. and that's where having mortar and pestle will really help you out too. It's about six minutes left on there. Right. Um, Can I? Sure. My husband wants to explain more. So. Okay. So, um, as you can see here on our king, I've gotten all the base colors done. Uh, we've got our brown, our, our dark brown. We've got the gold. I did a little bit of blue here for that crystal on the end of his scepter. We've got a little fan off to the side here. Keep us cool. I'm kind of setting him in front of that just for a moment. Uh, not quite ready to dry brush on paint that is still the tiniest bit tacky. Uh, so I'm going to move on to something else here. And this is something completely different. This is a fun piece. Um, try to get that into focus. So this is a cauldron golem. Uh, and admittedly, the idea I have is this is, you know, possibly going to be a monster to fight in the basement of the alchemist guild or you know maybe there's a witch's hut somewhere and she's got all these various cauldrons that form together to protect um right now all i've done on this is i gave it a black primer i uh, just uh this actually i didn't even spray paint this one this was just Acrylic, craft paint, black primer. And I want to see how it looks if I just do a very subtle... Uh, what is this? The lead belchers. Kind of a pewter iron look. I'm just going to do a very subtle dry brush on it. So we're going to take you know just the tiniest bits on a very stiff and wide brush here uh, and I'm gonna get a bit of that off on my paper towel and we're just gonna oh yeah I mean I'm I'm I've I'm barely I barely have a grip on this thing and I'm just kind of passing it over I uh, trying to give it those highlights of the slight metallic and oh man that that is coming out beautiful um so with my approach to painting um I mean, I've, I've not done a lot of mini, mini painting. I've done more terrain painting or... There, there's a bit, a, different, a, a bit of a different approach when it comes to, you know, painting your hero character versus painting the army and the horde of monsters and things. And I've, I've been definitely more on that second painting the hordes of monsters. Uh, and you, you know, if, if you really want to build a catalog, uh, a good army or base or catalog to, to deal some damage from, you gotta go quick and easy and I absolutely love it when whether it's terrain or a monster like this it takes a super simple you know base coat literally I think I might have watered down the black acrylic paint a little bit just to make it spread easier and we're looking at you know a minute of dry brushing with this slightly metallic 
paint really brings it to life. Um, and yeah, we're just going to hit that all over. I go a little heavier in some places. Yeah, you know, let's, let's see a little more shine on his hand. So now we've just got this thing that is, you know, made out of iron or pewter cauldrons. And boom, what what a difference that has made. I'm trying to put my hands up as a bit of a backdrop to to get the camera to focus. But yeah, what a difference that has made. Literally a drop of paint, a minute of, and I mean, you can see I'm just, just hitting this thing with a brush. Nice stiff brush with barely anything on it. I'm beating it with the brush. And it, it, it just pops out all those great textures. And we'll, we'll do one thing special on here, uh, as you see the, the face on there. And I'm gonna f just take, I'm thinking green. Uh, I, I want some, no, I'm not gonna use that enamel paint. I just want, here we go, grass. Green. I, w I just want those eyes to glow. That That's literally it. Now, if I wanted, obviously, I could make this thing, you know, dripping with various potion colors from the, you know, the different points of the, uh, you know, e each cauldron could have a different potion dripping from it, whatever. But I'm, I'm you know, I'm very simplistic when it comes to my... Uh, my monsters a lot of the time. So we're gonna take this tiny, tiny brush, uh, and then I'm just gonna you know, get, get most of the paint off of it. And we're gonna go in And boom. There there we go. Let's let's see if we can get up close. This doesn't want to focus. Webcam. Very nice. There we go. Just just some some green eyes glowing. That monster, uh, I, I would, it, you know, it doesn't stand up very well on its own all the time. You might add it to a base, you might not, but boom, it's done. So, over to Catherine on the stove cam. Nope, not even that. Oh. It's out of the oven. Well, it's, uh, here it is. My... Okay, we're done. <laughs> gonna move this away and yep. put down two trivets here grab my brushes and move out of here right. here we are out of the oven here you go ah. Nope. Fail. Has to go in my ear, babe. Okay. Alright, here we are. Out of the oven. Roasted to completion. With plenty of delicious stuffing and jus to soak up all that tastiness. So, like I said, there's enough, um, there's enough stuffing here to serve probably up to uh, six to eight people at most. But... You can start out with about four and maybe have some leftover stuffing. Um, you have the stuff that's already in the bird, which has soaked up all those delicious chicken juices, as well as the stuff that's underneath. And um, also all that glaze that slid off has a chance to kind of caramelize in those potatoes, onions, and 
bread cubes that you were cooking up earlier. Anyway, uh, I hope that you enjoyed this episode of Munchies and Minis, which admittedly, because it wasn't an hour ro- roasting time, was about halfway uh, minis. But that's okay. That's why we have this name. So um, we might get back to doing more mini painting, and I can start putting that uh, mini tag uh, back on our uh, back on our Twitch stream. Um, that is, if, uh, my husband is help- willing to come on and do a little bit of painting because heaven knows. I've tried doing cooking and painting at the same time. It does not work, but this is good. This is, I think this worked out nicely. Anyway, I've got to take photos of these and eat some dinner because uh, I've only had lunch today, but thank you so much for joining me. Uh, My name is Catherine Barsanistas. Uh, Do stay tuned for hopefully next week when I will... Oh goodness, I'll figure out something to cook up here on this this stream here, but we'll... um, We'll figure it out until then. Anyway, you have a great evening and wonderful rest of your September. And uh, as always, stay safe, stay sane, stay you. My name is Catherine Barsanistas, and you have a great night. Bye.